सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट केयरफुली लास्ट वीक वी डन two episodes of this very special concept of cut the clutter which is between cut the clutter and first person second draft where i talked about the kind of person bidra wale was the kind of phenomenon he was and about many interactions with him in the golden double and also details of operation blue star now given that a lot of you seem to have liked it and there was there was a demand for more i had said that you might actually end up seeing two more of these next week which is this week so next week has now come the two episodes that you will see this week the first one will be about 1984 the year because there is always a debate about which has been the most newsy year in india's independent history in many ways i believe 1984 was that year and i will explain to you why i think so and the second part that you will see on friday saturday it will be released friday evening this comes out thursday evening so thursday friday the next one will be released friday evening that will be on the massacres of six in delhi just my eyewitness account as a reporter once again that that's an issue on which books have been written films have been made so i cannot give you the conclusive and full story but i can give you the story of what i saw what the reporter's eyes saw so that will be the fourth part in this and the last part of this series then at some point at some point i might give you another episode say on operation black thunder that is something happened something that happened in 1988 so we'll come to that also now was 1984 the most newsy year the newsiest year in, in india's independent history there will always be argument over which might be the most important or newsy year in india's history and if you asked old reporters like me each one would name a favorite year decided purely on the basis of when she broke a famous story she or he broke a famous story the reporters like that only self centered competitive take no prisoners vain and a little bit crazed i could be accused of having been all of these particularly by those beat down on a story or two over these decades i might have said unkind things about those who beat me as well it's mutual but perhaps not even they would contest my claim that 1984 has been by far the newsiest year in india's post independence history also because no one story dominated the year you can find many years in which big stories broke out but 1984 had a lot of stories and i'm going to tell you a whole bunch of them in this episode particularly those that i dealt with directly as a reporter 1984 had multiple turning points operation blue star mutinies by six in some army units indira gandhi's assassination the massacres of six in delhi and elsewhere the rise of rajiv gandhi and his majority of 415 and as if that wasn't enough the bhopal gas tragedy and then the indian army's historic ascent of the siachen glacier all of that happened in 1984 each of these was a turning point and each of these each of these still festers it still endures it was the kind of year when newsrooms would feel a paucity of reporters and no reporters vanity notwithstanding i can't claim that i covered each one of these history changers i did not cover bhopal at all and i can't say that the transit halt at bhopal on way to jabalpur to cover the court martial of alleged sikh mutineers would give me the right to claim the bhopal date line many other stories the elections the anti sikh massacres the assassination consumed entire teams of reporters and all i can lay claim to is a reasonable slice of each but a footnote i did break the story of india's move up the siachen of course four decades ago now the term breaking news wasn't in the vogue yet i got my first opportunity to cover a big election too in 1984 and it was a trial by fire that i failed i was covering the gwalior constituency where the young maharaja madhavrao sindhya challenged atal bihari vajpayee whom we all so loved and believed he could never lose to an upstart 
It was a genuinely sexy story. Vajpayee had gone to college on a scholarship given by Sindhya's father. His native home was just a couple of semi pakka rooms in Gwalior, that is Vajpayee's native home, with a kacha courtyard and a hand pump. In a story almost universally headlined King vs. Commoner, Vajpayee was the obvious winner. So suggested inexperienced stupid me and was proven wrong as I have never been in calling an election. Once again, the only reporter who even called this election right was Tavleen Singh. It taught me the meaning of a wave, how it obliterates logic, reputations, history. This also became evident again in the 2014 election in India, which was the first wave election in India after 30 years, 1984. 2014. It was also understandably the richest year possible for old reporters' tales. Some of stupidity, I just told you one from Gwalior, and some of quick life-saving presence of mind. On the first day of Operation Blue Star, for example, when you had st still not realized the gravity of the intent with which the clampdown had been carried out. At least the two of us, Brahmachalani, who's now a well-known strategic affairs expert, Brahmachalani and I, out of the three reporters who had stayed behind when the me throughout the entire press corps to Delhi, we probably thought we were still on some kind of a riot slash curfew outing on the morning of June 3, as we found ourselves in the same neighborhood in Amritsar, in old Amritsar. We had never met before, Brahma and I. Along the outer precincts of the walled city, we were both drawn to the striking image of a few young Sikhs clad in lungis, tied with ropes and being taken away by mostly six feet plus Javans of the guards regiment. I had never seen human beings tied up like this before and definitely not held by army jawans carrying SLRs as, as the regular, regular issue rifle was those days, the assault, assault rifle. SLR stands for self-loading rifles. They all had fingers on the trigger. I was made to regret my impetuosity just then as a police patrol came rushing as I started taking pictures. In a state under such censorship, this is the last image anybody wanted out. Please see the picture again. Now I am glad Raghuraya had left a camera with me while he left for Kolkata to shoot with Mother Teresa for an American publication. I think it was a Time magazine. And he had also taught me to use that camera too because those days they did not made, make idiot proof cameras. But it did not feel like such a good idea then as we spent maybe a couple of hours locked up in a walled city police station. Taking those pictures using that camera did not look like such a good idea because these were a tough few hours in the police station. The station house officer or what might be described as an OC in some parts of the country was in a rage. And I quote him, you so and so's, obviously I can't publish the expletives he used, usually spending com compliments to our mothers and sisters. He shouted again, our temple is being desecrated, the army has taken over everything and you are taking pictures and I am again deleting an expletive. You think this is a dash 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 tamasha? He then threatened to shoot us and throw our bodies away and people could later then decide, figure out who killed us, the army or the militants. Nobody would blame the police anyway because he was not in charge. Both of us pleaded with him that we were just harmless reporters. He flung my ID card and we soon figured out that while he was upset about the siege of the temple, the greater provocation was the army encroaching on his turf. I tried calming him down by simply sucking up to him. We were outraged by the army operation too, I said. All Hindus prayed at Gurdwaras and so on and so forth. But, but it was of no use. This was a very angry policeman at 7.30 in the morning. I thought if we could still somehow buy a little time, simply get word across to somebody in the city that we were in this police station and alive, it would make his death sentence less tenable. Brahma, Brahma Chalani was more idealistic, honest and courageous than me. So he asked the cop who, who by now had a permanent frown, under which law are we being held? Kanun Elogy, the cop said, the SHO. Kanun Elogy. Eh pushta kedi dafa de andar fade hai. Law, he wants to know under which section of the law have we caught him. He, he said and then with a smirk, he turned to one of his minions. And I quote him again in Punjabi and I'll translate it. Dasi bhai anu tu. Okay, go ahead and tell him brother. And before the minion could answer, he said, just shoot them 
and throw a couple of kilos of opium on their bodies. That will suffice. Or maybe a pistol each in addition to the opium. There are some kept only for this purpose. And then in a turn straight out of a latter day Vishal Bhardwaj and Kashyap movie, the minion woke up in alarm. And I quote him again, the minion now, opium is quite enough SHO Sabadar. Why are we wasting pistols? We don't have that many and we keep needing them all the time. Now, it may sound funny now, but wasn't so funny then. And I don't know about Brahma, but I was very, very, very scared. What this exchange had done, however, was lighten the atmosphere. Because, you know, this this exchange about opium plus pistol or the, or, or, or the need not to waste pistols, because everybody laughed, this had lightened the atmosphere just a little bit. As all the cops had also joined in, in the same derisive banter. I continued to beg to be allowed to use the phone just once to call Mr. Olak, who is expecting to see me, I said, in his office at this very moment, very urgently. Olak Saab, the head of the subsidiary intelligence bureau, the IB's officer in Amritsar, was quite popular, respected and well known. It was a complete bluff. His full name is MPS Olak. He was indeed the IPS officer who headed the SIB there. So that, that name was not a farce. It was, it was the truth. He knew me well. We had even been neighbors briefly in Chandigarh. And I thought if it could impress the SHO, just letting us make that one call to him, to Mr. Olak, it may just save our lives. Name dropping, pulling rank are all legitimate repertorial tactics. And after a while, it worked. Even the furious SHO did not want to override the possible wish of a senior IPS officer, particularly as everybody in the local police knew him and respected him. I called Olak's home and his wife picked up. I told her an utter lie that Mr. Olak must be waiting for us in his office for an urgent discussion, but we were caught up in some disturbance and where we were now looked after at the police station division such and such. She understood the situation and was quick to call her husband. Five minutes later, just five minutes later, the phone rang. The SIB office told the SHO we were needed by Mr. Olak and that a jeep was on its way to fetch us. This is where all the excitement ended. Though I did get a gentle, gentle scolding from Mr. Olak later. He of course sent a jeep and ha had us fetched. The Olaks now live in retirement in their small country home on the outskirts of Chandigarh. And I can now also reveal that the IB officer I mentioned in the second part of the series, the blue star part of the series, who had told me with dismay how his warnings to not underestimate the militant firepower or resolve in the temple to fight back went unheeded was none other than Mr. Olak, one of the finest intelligence officers I have traveled with in my journey as a reporter. Besides indeed being a lifesaver for me, gifted with a wonderful, generous and quick-witted Sardarni. People are as central to us reporters' lives as money or checkbooks might be to a banker or a businessman. People are the capital of our working lives, except unlike any currency or some of the assets, they mostly become more valuable over time. And it is uncanny how they keep resurfacing in your lives. That's why I had promised some people stories in this episode. I still cannot reveal the source of the Seachi news break. The fact that our army had moved on to desolate heights in what was codenamed Operation Meghdoot, the eternal story of the world's highest battlefield which has defied solution for four decades now, I cannot tell you the source because I followed the rule that even after a source is gone, wait 10 years. That's why I, I was able to tell you the source for that Nelly telegram that we had talked about in our Assam series. Not about this one yet. But I can tell you about the two key commanders involved. Lieutenant General M.L. Chibber, then GOCNC Northern Command, and Lieutenant General P.N. Hoon, then GOC 15 Corps, Srinagar. And later, Director General of Military Operations. Hoon became Director General of Military Operations. I got a ringing admonition from him later when I went to see him to check on a follow-up story on Seachin and addressed him as DMO. Or I said, Sir, I have DMO ke office. Mein aaya hun, kuch khabar to milegi. The old title for the job. That was the old title. He got angry and I quote him, I am no bloody DMO. I am DGMO young fellow. He said to me, I was reasonably, suitably chastened. Both officers were proud of moving on to Seachin and beating the Pakistanis. 
I told you one was the army commander, one was the core commander. Both were proud of moving on to Siachen and beating the Pakistanis, who had apparently planned a similar operation and each claimed he had played a more important role, Chibbert and Hoon. In fact, when I somewhat breathlessly suggested to Hoon that it looked like we had outflanked the Pakistanis in a couple of chases to the top, he straightened in his chair in some alarm. And I quote him again, outflanked? Who told you that word? Outflanked? That was the word I used to plan my strategy. He said, oops, I think now I should have known I was looking at one of the future primetime stars of the shouting channels decades later. Who later, who later became a real hawk, even joined the Shiv Sena once. You saw him breathing fire on many of our warrior channels. Chibbard, on the other hand, became one of India's foremost peaceniks and set up an NGO to talk peace with Pakistan. You never know what growing out of uniform can do to you. Both continued featuring in our lives as reporters for decades. As did General K. Sundarji, Krishna Swami Sundarji, though in a very different manner qualitatively. After Blue Star, he became one of India's most dashing and futuristic chiefs. He became chief just after Blue Star, after General Badia retired. He was, General Badia was later assassinated in retirement in Pune. General Sundarji became one of our most dashing and futuristic chiefs, shifting the entire outlook and doctrine from defensive to offensive, attack and, attack and halt to assault and keep moving. Terrestrial to airborne, pedestrian to mechanized. No other chief has left behind such an abiding doctrinal legacy in India's history. He became one of my favorite people over the years. He indulged me greatly too. You may want to see the obit I wrote to him, Soldier of the Mind. I will share a link with you. That obit appeared on 10th of February 1999 in the Indian Express. But I had started with him on a really embarrassing note, embarrassing for me. In my coverage of Operation Blue Star, which drew wide international notice, I had made what would be an inconsequential mistake for any civilian. But was it truly idiotic blunder for someone with claims to being a defense reporter? I had made the mistaken assumption that the 25 pounders used by the army to maul the Akal Takhat had fired in a trajectory mode. What that that would mean is guns firing almost vertically upward, upwards. You've seen those guns firing, say, from visuals of the war in Ukraine. The guns seem like they're firing like this because then shells go and fall at a great distance. The shells then follow a parabolic trajectory to hit the target. I described the risk it involved in a crowded locality in Amritsar and how brilliant our gunners were supposedly, that hardly any strayed despite the summer breeze. It was just a hyped compliment to our gunners, but embarrassingly wrong and inaccurate. The guns had fired in the direct mode like this and from a very close range. Many soldiers pointed this out to me just as my stories came out, but none as rudely and colorfully as General Sundarji. And I quote him, ha, you defense reporters, he would say, you can't even tell the difference between bore and caliber. And then turning the knife, even as he laughed, enjoying his own joke, he would say, you can surely be big bores despite having low caliber. Good joke, no? At my cost. We became friends, General Sundarji and I, fellow travelers on the strategic conference circuit or what was called as track two circuit those days. And he even wrote a column at my urging at India Today. And I pleased him very much by naming the column Brass Tax, which was the code name of his controversial exercise that nearly took us to war with Pakistan in 1987. But he never stopped repeating that lesson on gunnery to me. Anytime I said something, ah, you can't even tell between a gun that fires in direct firing mode and on parabola, forget it. Firing on trajectory, firing straight. If you don't know even that much, how can you be a defense reporter? Point taken. Reporters' lives are rough, chaotic, but fun, which creates justification for a lot of excess. Overeating, some drinking, no exercise and smoking, though not the last one in my case. In the summer of 1984, therefore, I weighed 83 kilos. It's 73 now. One of the fittest members of the reporters' group was always Satish Jacob. Mark Tully's much-loved deputy at the BBC. We first met in Assam in 1983 when he was covering the aftermath of the Nelly massacre. He saw me, I climbed, I, I walked with him 
to one of the hotels in Guwahati, the only reasonable hotel which I can't afford, but he was staying there the Bellevue. view so we were climbing uphill and i was short of breath he immediately told me i had to learn to exercise and by the time action was speaking in amritsar brought me from london my first pair of running shoes a pair of adidas you could not get athletic shoes in india by then and by teaching me to run satish added several energetic years to my life as i said earlier people keep coming back in us reporters lives usually more importantly than before and that's the reason we must we must preserve our notebooks and memory think about a kingfisher flight from delhi to mumbai i'll take you there about about 15 years ago there was only one other passenger in the front cabin sitting across the aisle from me and i thought he looked familiar he had a weather beaten face tough firm broad shouldered demeanor and soldier and soldierly countenance even as he poured over what looked like a sheaf of excel sheets we exchanged some where have i met you before kind of glances and then he broke the ice he said i bet you won't remember me but i haven't forgotten he said he asked me if i recalled that in 1981 in aizol in mizoram i was bitten by awful dim dim flies that terrible flies and a crpf patrol that was passing by had taken me under their protection and they took me to their company sick bay for treatment his name the gentleman sitting across the aisle from me his name was balwan singh gelawat bs gelawat and he commanded that company in mizoram 1981 crpf company then he asked if i remembered unauthorizedly hanging out at a camouflaged and fortified medium machine gun nest on the top of a building in amritsar's brambuta akhada overlooking the golden temple during operation blue star he was now the commandant of that CR crpf battalion providing the assault troops covering fire and then he said again and you must be wondering what am i doing sitting here on this plane he asked with a smile he said his son said set up a business in mumbai and he goes there often to help them out particularly as they also have large property developments what business is to your son's run i asked india bulls he said small word but people come back to your lives of the many days spent on the pickets in that story story year one particularly endures having realized the stupidity of a media clamp down in punjab the army had now given me the permission to go and witness the gcm or general court martial of alleged sikh mutineers following operation blue star in jabalpur cantonment nobody nobody put any restrictions nobody censored anything it was like any other court hearing albeit with uniformed officers one uniformed mutineer after another was seated on a chair in front of the judges and lawyers each very young innocent shaken and contrite each with the same story that in his unit far away from home he heard rumors that all young male sikhs were being slaughtered in punjab women were were being mass raped gurdwaras desecrated those were the rumors gurdwaras desecrated and destroyed the golden temple had been reduced to rubble again a rumor there was no way of checking no one to believe nobody trusted dur darshan or even the newspapers actually most of this was fiction none of this was happening in punjab yes it was a terrible terrible event yes a lot of people died in in operation blue star yes the akal takht was destroyed but not the golden temple it might have had a few bullets pass through it but was standing there pretty much intact the library area some other areas had caught fire but the temple was intact the gurdwaras elsewhere in the state were fine all the other stories of women being mass raped of people being slaughtered mass slaughtered six being mass slaughtered were not true most of this as i just said was fiction but it was still believed by this young people young people in uniform and it made them angry enough to rebel so it confirmed yet again if any confirmation was still needed that nothing harms a society and a nation more than a deliberate denial of truthful information to its citizens particularly in a period of trauma it leads to a tragic situation where all rumors are seen as true and the worst rumors as the truest and that leaves an angry isolated soldier with little option other than to pick up his rifle march on to delhi and shoot anybody who tried to stop him even if it happens to be one of his officers a commander whoever 
I know nothing can justify mutiny in any army, but these hapless boys were not the only ones to blame in 1984. There were lots of guilty people and some of them we'll talk about in the next episode as I give you my eyewitness account of the massacres in Delhi.